BioBalance HealthCast episode 265, what you need to know about tremors. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counsel. So one of the things that always amazes me about your knowledge base is how (laughs) readily facts just tumble out of your mind. And we've had any number of wide-ranging conversations, and you just know stuff. And I'm stunned because as I've gotten older, I don't feel like I know stuff anymore the way I used to. So I'm impressed by that. (laughs) But, But you specialize in your knowledge, and most of us do. And you were telling me the other day that you ran into a situation with a patient that was outside of your special focus. And so you've had to educate yourself Mm -hmm. uh, in order to be able to take care of them, which is, again, what professionals do. If you run into Mm -hmm. something you don't know, you know, you learn it or you refer or or you do both, whatever. But your goal is to understand enough to make an intelligent intervention that's going to be helpful, whatever that might be. And so we were talking about what it was that you were, you didn't feel like you were so grounded enough in mm-hmm. at the moment. And some of it was stuff you'd had years ago, but in the work that you do, it never really surfaced as an issue. So now you've encountered it. And so we're going to be talking about it today. And that is the existence of and the understanding of tremors. And in doing some research to learn more about it that you've shared with me, we have learned that tremors can be symmetrical or asymmetrical. They can be bilateral or unilateral, one side of the body or both sides of the body. They can be uh, action, action-based action tremors, like when you're, you're reaching for something and your hand shakes for whatever reason, and that's part of what you want to find out. Mm-hmm. Or they can be tremors at rest. And the most mm-hmm. astonishing part of all that, that that I learned was that most uh, people have tremors, and many of the people that have tremors don't know they have tremors until somebody else points it out. Uh, I mean, one of the most uh, significant indicators is when somebody else notices that you have the shakes or you have a tremor of some kind, Mm -hmm. then when you become conscious of it, you need to start finding out what's going on with me. You don't want to go from zero to 100, oh, my God, I'm going to die, I've got whatever. (laughs) But there are symptoms and signs that can distinguish among types of tremors, causes of tremors, and suggest treatments. So today we're, we're going to talk about that. So, so one of the things that I find very interesting about tremors is that in the past, as an OBGYN, I didn't pay attention to that because it was outside of my field of, of, of care. Of your focal point. Right. Yeah. And now I now, take, I now do preventive medicine, and I now do a lot of diagnosing of illnesses that I hadn't previously treated. Mm-hmm. So... Often I come to a circumstance where I have a patient I'm caring for with hormones and preventive medicine and trying to make their life more full and better, and they come up with a new symptom, and I send them to the right doctors, and they come back and say, well, he didn't do anything. I didn't get a diagnosis. I didn't get a treatment. He said, don't worry about it, and they just blew him or her off and then I have to then say okay I need to find another doctor we go to the second doctor same thing now are these guys or girls busy are they don't think it's going to kill this patient so that they don't think it's important I don't know what the issue is but clearly the patients I'm talking about are good communicators they follow up they are very they are very easy to talk to it is not something in on their side of the problem it is something where the doctor's just too busy or doesn't think it's important so that's how I get into this then I have to say, I need to gather as much information about this as possible, and I tell my patient, I'm going to get to the bottom of this. I mean, there's no reason I can't get to the bottom of it. Right. I am I am making a promise I, I, in many ways, used to not make because I couldn't get to the bottom right. of it, but I can. I have the resources to do that. So I talk to a neurologist who, who said this patient has a tremor, you need to go through this workup. And she needs to be going through this 
partially because a tremor means something bad could be happening, or she could be part of the large population of people in the United States and all over who have an essential tremor, which means there's no disease that's going to progress and make it worse. It doesn't mean you have a brain tumor or a or anything wrong with your brain. It doesn't mean that you're going to die from it. It isn't going to cause you anything but, and this is very important, embarrassment. Because when someone has a tremor, people look at them funny. It's like when you have a limp, people go, oh, they're sick. You have a tremor, oh, they're having DTs, they're coming down from alcohol, they're on drugs, or they have Parkinson's, or they have a brain problem. People look at you differently. And that, and, and it makes it impossible for some people to do their jobs. People who are have their face in the public can't have this tremor. Mm -hmm. So they need not only a an answer, because, <clears throat> because that means they don't worry about whether they're going to die tomorrow of a brain tumor. So we have to go th walk through a diagnostic process, both for the finding of the diagnosis and also for allaying the fears of the patient and and then treating him or her. Well, and that's one of the distinctions that sets you apart. <clears throat> I mean, you, you are committed to trying to explain your understanding of what's going on and your treatment protocol so that the patient knows what you're doing and why and knows how to interpret what's going on. A lot of doctors don't seem to take the time to do that or to value it in the same way that you do. And if I'm not med medically educated, in their mind, they may not waste time giving me medical terminology, or they may throw some fancy phraseology at yeah, me. Yeah, but that doesn't as help if it you. were an explanation. It's like speaking Greek. I mean, and that doesn't help me <laughs> feel better, get better, or have hope. I mean, it leads more to magical thinking. You know, mm -hmm. the pill will make it better. The treatment will make it better. The X-ray will make it better. <laughs> I yeah. mean, you know, X-rays. By the way, x-rays don't do anything for you. They just give you a diagnosis. Yeah, they take a <laughs> so picture of they you. take a picture of you. My, my parents used to always go, oh, well, I'm going to the doctor and I'm getting a CAT scan. Like that was going to treat them. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, so what are you going to do then? Yeah. And they'd say, well, whatever he says, I'm not doing it. <laughs> I mean, don't do the CAT scan if you're not going to do it. Anything about it, you know. So it's it's one of those things where our misperceptions of what things do. Mm -hmm. Tests are to help your doctor interpret what's wrong with you. And then the doctor's job is to tell you what's wrong with you and then allay your fears of some horrible illness. But to tell you in a way that helps you understand what is your degree of risk? What should you expect and prepare for mm -hmm. in terms of gradual decline? Uh, you know, if you have uh, dementia mm -hmm. and you it's a progressive disease it's a progressive disease and, is and your you want disease to measure progressive the progression. You know, what are what are my <clears> odds <throat> of still being dysfunctional in six months or a year or two years and a lot of times especially with elderly people families intervene and don't want that person to be told yeah well that's something not, that might upset them you know that's not appropriate I mean, I don't care how old I am. I want to know what's wrong. Well, and I do too. And I don't and think if I'm I think dying, you have tell to tell me I'm dying so they have that to I can put yourself in the place of of that person. What if mm -hmm. I were 90 and someone said you have this horrible illness? I I don't care if I'm 90 or if I'm 40. I want to know what that illness is and how long I have and you know, we never know how long we have. It could be tomorrow, but but no, in and general, we believe in the power of prayer. We believe in miracles and all that. You know, and something but, can happen. But, it but can, I still want to know. By the way, in order to no, that's what I'm saying. I know. I mean, we believe in it, and it does happen. And it does happen. But it also happens that people say, "Well, you've got six months to live," and they die within six months. Mm -hmm. And I would rather know and try to make my peace with it as me than just have it happen and have people protecting me. I mean, that's my own personal agenda. That's right. But I think that's a thing that physicians need to get their head around. Who is their patient? Is it this individual who's sick or dying, or, or is, is it, it the family that's caring for Or is it their insurance them? company? Or the, or the insurance <laughs> company. Amen. Because yeah. that's not your patient. So p part of this is, I mean, granted... The reason doctors get this way, they get jaded because they, they have a lot of patients that come in and they just 
just throw up everything that happened to them in in the last year and there's no time for that and it and they they don't know what's important so they just tell you everything that gives them too much information and that is not how you go to the doctor we've done a podcast on that mm-hmm. how do you limit it how do you get your doctor's attention how do you get what you need from that doctor but on the other end of it okay so so a doctor's exhausted from many patients like that when you come in and say i've got this and you answer the questions when does what makes it worse what makes it better when does it happen you know that those questions are what doctors should ask or you should answer and tell them but once that's in their their data bank, then they should have in their mind a list, almost an algorithm of, okay, so now I want to know, they ask directed questions, so they figure out, are you going over here to something that is a terrible illness? Mm-hmm. I mean, such as Parkinson's. Well, Parkinson's is a progressive, difficult, very, very... I mean, in many cases, fast, in many cases, not. Mm-hmm. Progressive illness where um, a tremor is, is usually one-sided, and it's usually, you usually have this with your hands. A Parkinson's tremor. Parkinson's tremor. Yeah, because there are other kinds of tremors. Yeah, there's other, but this is a Parkinson's tremor. It's usually on one side of your body more than the other, mm-hmm. and usually you lose all your smiles, smiles, frowns everything your face becomes a mask and then your walking gets really slow and your balance goes is off Mm -hmm. because i i watched this with my father-in-law and it it was not a pretty pretty progression that habitual pill rolling Mm -hmm. they do this it's a neural firing uh nerve firing on and there but other other people also do habitual pill rolling behaviors or just part of what has to happen (laughs) is that doctors are trained to do a, a decision matrix in making an assessment, mm-hmm. a, a, a diagnosis or an assessment. So doctors learn in medical school and then they practice it. You know, you develop a defi- decision tree. If A, then B, C, or D. If C, then A, B, or C. And, and so mm-hmm. you go through that to see what you think you're looking at and how you intend to treat it. Right. So it's not conscious, usually. Usually you get an answer to a group of questions, and right. you, and that tells you it's not all those things. It may be these two things. Well, and some of the questions are pretty simple, I mean, and pretty revealing. Like you were talking about an essential tremor versus a Parkinson's tremor. Let's go back to that and okay. describe what is an essential tremor, and then go back to what what you would identify as a Parkinsonian tremor. Well, essential tremor is just so you know, is the most common kind of tremor. Mm -hmm. It is a tremor at rest, although it can be, I mean, it can be- At rest means you're not pushing against gravity. You're not standing, you're not walking, you're not walking. Yeah, I mean, even if you're resting, then, I mean, some people can physically will themselves to stop stop their tremor, but you see it in their handwriting. It's usually shaky. So they have it even when they're fine, writing fine motor, issue. fine motor skills. So, so it's when you're it. It's both. It's resting and active, but mostly resting. Okay. Okay. It's bilateral. It is a genetic, and we call it autosomal dominant. That means it's not in the X Y chromosomes. It's one of the other chromos. It's one of the other chromosomes. So we look at um, autosomal dominant means. If one of your parents had it, and you get that one gene, then you're going to get it. It's not like you have to get it from both parents. So, so we look at family history for essential tremor. We look but, but at. But it's not a precursor of a, a more significant illness. So, if you have a tremor, the tremor may get worse as you get older, but mm-hmm. it isn't going to cause brain cancer or dementia or Parkinson's or heart attack because you have the tremor. Right. If it's an essential the tremor, tremor itself can get worse with stress it can get worse i mean and and that's common people are told they have a tremor and they're being evaluated and they're they're more nervous so the tremor gets worse but but you can there are many drugs that increase essential tremors caffeine um add medicines or any kind of amphetamines anything that stimulates the nervous system anything Mm -hmm. that keeps you awake things for narcolepsy you know, drugs from narcolepsy are going are going to make an essential tremor worse. Mm-hmm. So, 
those are things that your doctor looks at because you've usually given all your drugs and and makes sure that not one of those is causing the problem. And so that's something that they're doing in their head. They may not ask you, Mm -hmm. but if they don't mention it and you're on one of those meds, you have to say, is is it my ADD medicine? Should I decrease that? So that's part of that decision matrix. And mm-hmm. so you find out, is it my medicine? Is it caffeine? Is it stress? Is it an essential tremor or a Parkinsonian tremor? Because there's a branch. Mm-hmm. And then is if, if it's not Parkinsonian, and so we're still thinking essential, then you also have a branch point where you say, is it a brain tumor? Mm-hmm. Uh, or is it... Uh, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Uh, some other uh, degenerative brain issue mm-hmm. as distinguished from a uh, nerve... Uh, expression or a yeah a genetic nerve degeneration or or abnormality so doctors always have to rule out the worst thing right so that means we are likely to do an mri of your head and see if there's a brain tumor if there's to rule it out if your brain is shrunk or if there's an area in your brain that has gotten smaller that could be dementia or alzheimer's so you need a picture to make this diagnosis, essential tremor is the best thing it could be. Okay, mm-hmm. that's a that's a diagnosis of exclusion. So you have to talk to the doctor. You need to go over your meds. You need to go over. He needs or she needs to see what kind of tremor it is. You need to answer the questions. Think about them ahead of time so you don't spend a lot of time eyeing and whatever. They'll do an exam, check your reflexes, check how you stand on one leg, things like that to see if your balance is off. And then then they'll order an x-ray. You'll go back and they'll say, it's, so, so hopefully they say, it's okay. It's where they go through all the di- branching elements to say, it's not this, it's not this, it's not this, it's not this. And those are all The last usually, man standing is what they call it. Right. Which Alzheimer's used to be mm-hmm. uh, predominantly a diagnosis of exclusion. But they, now we they, have an X-ray to look at it. Yeah, so they can yeah. measure the myelin and the. Well, no, they measure the. It shrinks. The Your brain shrinks, and then dementia. Oftentimes, if dementia is from many strokes, your brain kind of looks like Swiss cheese on X-ray. Wow. It's it's scary to even see that, yeah. and and the patient's still talking. <laughs> I mean, and acting somewhat normal, right. and. You know, but they have problems with remembering things. So, so an X-ray tells you a lot, and that's. But not just a flat X-ray. It's got to be a, a CT scan or an MRI. So, as we're going through this process, you may have to have multiple. You may have to have multiple uh, evaluations. You may have to have blood tests. You may have to. I mean, they're going to ask you whether you drink, and because DTs, when you have. You have tremors if you're coming off of alcohol. So that's something that they'll ask you, and you should be honest. Delirium tremens. Right, and so you get the shakes, shakes, and other things, hallucinations. And and they give you they give you a glass of of alcohol, and it goes away. So so basically, that is one thing. But that's only if you're somebody who drinks a lot. But the key and the most important test, which was so interesting, because I go to my daughter with these, and my daughter, my daughter, the doctor, She's a physician, my yeah. daughter, the doctor, and I, and she's newly out of training, and she knows all the new stuff, and I, I, I went over this case with her in, in, I mean, extensively everything I knew, and she looked at me and she goes, "Why didn't they just give her a couple glasses of wine? Because we know she's not an alcoholic, so we've ruled that out." But if you have two glasses of wine and you have essential tremor, no other kind of tremor, it goes away. For, for, till the wine wears off. <laughs> till the wine wears off. Yeah. And so Which I, means becoming alcohol. Becoming alcohol. Yeah. I mean, I said, are you kidding me? <laughs> she said, that's the cheapest, easiest test. You can do it. You know, you can just have them go home and do that. They have that. You can skip. Many of these other tests, right. because nothing else is going to get better with alcohol except alcohol, you know, delirium tremens. So, so you have to know the history. Right. But if that works, then you can relieve their worry. Some need to see it on an X-ray, see a picture, anyway, and that's fine. So, so then you go back to this patient, and you say, "This is what I've learned about tremors, and now that I know these things." You need a couple of glasses of wine. <laughs> I'm in a better place to help you understand so that you're not afraid mm-hmm. and to figure out what the best course forward is for you. Mm-hmm. And this particular patient 
was very receptive to that. Oh, very pleased about that. She, she, it was like she even looked different the next time I saw her. It was this, this horror that she was carrying around with her that I might be dying, I might have a brain tumor, I might. I mean, and she had so frightening. And she had brain tumors in her family. Yeah. So she's she's seen the progress of that, and that's terrifying. And so she. So in this case, in this case, I was. I mean, this is not my area, and I don't pretend to. I mean, I don't pretend to be a neurologist, and I know it's much more complicated than all of this. Right. But this is the outline of what you should expect, and no one told her any reassuring things. No one said, "Well, I know it's not Parkinson's because of blank, blank, blank." They just said it's not Parkinson's. It's not Parkinson's, and that most of us develop tremors if we live long enough. And, right. and they're not necessarily uh, significantly disruptive or dangerous. They're just things that we develop. And so if we know that, we won't be afraid. Yeah, if you have certain circumstances, almost anyone will have a tremor. Right. Hypoglycemia. Mm-hmm. If, you, if you don't. If you haven't eaten and you're exercising or working <coughs> and, and you skip lunch because yeah. you're doing physical labor. Or even if you're. Your body when I'm in the you. office all day and I just forget to eat because I'm so focused on what I'm doing, I get to 5 o'clock. I can't think anymore, and or six o'clock, and and I'm starting to I'm starting to have just a tiny bit of tremor, which I've never had. I don't think I ever forget to eat. That's a behavior or a, a symptom. That's a part of being a surgeon. Stuff. You never you never think about food when you're operating, so you can go all day well, without yeah, operating. Surgery has to. You got somebody open up. They say, "I'm going to McDonald's. I'll be back." You can't do that. And I and by the way, I, I mean people who have tremors can actually perform their jobs. Just fine. You don't have to worry about that. I mean, there there are doctors who have resting tremors, but when they go into the operating room, intentionally, they're going in and operating, they don't have a tremor. Yeah. You know, so you don't have to well, but we were judge them that. There are with some that. professions that are self-limiting. That way. Like, you can't fly a jet. Right. Yeah. Pilots are, are very limited. They have to be extremely healthy, and they can't be, they can't have a tremor, and they can't have a drug that treats a tremor uh-huh. because the drugs that treat tremors are beta blockers, which are they they calm your um, um, all the receptor sites for the sympathetic nervous system that that make you up or make your heart heart rate go up. So they decrease tremors, but they also make people with tremors really tired, so they can't always take that. So there are some. Um, seizure medications that we use off-label for tremors, and they work. So that still, you can't do that when you're flying. Right. So essentially then, most people get tremors if they live long enough. They're more or less significant. The challenge is to understand what you have, what you're looking at. And if you have uh, symmetrical or bilateral tremors, less risk, less danger usually, and you, if you have an essential tremor, more common, more typical, mm-hmm. it, the tremor itself will progress, but other issues won't progress from it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there are some tremors from which deadly progressions do occur. And so it's important to find out what kind of tremor you have, what you're facing, what the treatment protocols are for it, or whether you can relax and learn how to moderate your own tremor response uh, to things to stress or diet or caffeine or things like that. So don't be afraid. Go get information and do what you can to, to be a, a contributing, controlling agent in your own health care. Ruling out everything bad. Yeah. Makes, it's a good thing. <laughs> take, takes, a, takes a weight off of you, mm-hmm. and it changes you. So you don't have to find something. You can find it's not something. So go ahead and... Ask the doctor about it. Go ahead and get evaluated. You don't like that doctor? Go to somebody else who will actually get to the bottom of it and tell them up front. I need to know what I don't have. It can be a tremor in your voice. Yes, it doesn't have it can to be, be a body tremor. Some it people have be. voice tremors. So, so in any case, yeah. knowledge is calming. If you if you rule things out. So that's something we didn't learn in medical school. We just learned to diagnose things. So just remind them that you need to know what it isn't. Thank you for listening. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. 
For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit BioBalanceHealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at Facebook.com slash BioBalanceHealth. Find Brett Newcomb at BrettNewcomb.com.